Snow Tracks is sponsored by Ski Doo, Better Rides, Better Riders. Yamaha, snowmobiles built for the real world. That's the Yamaha Advantage. And by FXR Racing, world class outerwear. On today's episode of Snow Tracks, we're going to talk about what we believe to be the most iconic model in the history of the sport. So sit back and listen up to the history of the Polaris Indy. The Indy was born in response to Polaris' rabid 1970s participation in all forms of snowmobile racing. Interestingly, the first Polaris snowmobile with an independent IFS suspension was the legendary RXL oval racing sled. However, the Indy technology developed on the iced oval pales when considering the amazing impact the original 340cc 56 horsepower liquid-cooled TXL Indy had on cross-country racing in the late 70s and early 80s. Quite frankly, when the TXL Indy arrived on the cross-country racing scene, it literally destroyed the competition. The sled had a stranglehold on the legendary Winnipeg to St. Paul I-500, making it almost pointless to race any other brand other than an Indy. Undeniably, the Indy was born to race. However, we suspect Polaris did not know how popular the Indy would become when it morphed into a full-on production model. By 1982, the Indy had swallowed the then-legendary liquid-cooled 500cc Fuji Triple and became the Indy 500, endorsed by the Indianapolis 500 winning Unser family. Something interesting happened in 1983 when the Indy chassis birthed the Indy Trail with a lowly 440, then a 488cc fan cooler under hood. This move absolutely cemented the future of the Indy chassis as a do-all, all-purpose platform. Proving the design was right the first time, throughout the 80s, the Indy remained largely unchanged from the original TXL Indy. Nothing exceeds like excess, and Polaris knew it had the market by the tail with the Trail Indy, the new Indy 400, and then the Indy 650 Triple. The aura of performance the capable Indy chassis carried was like magic dust. To say you rode an Indy was akin to Clint packing a 44 Magnum. By the end of the 80s, Polaris pulled off what became a literal snowmobile marketing coup. The company developed a lightweight twin-cylinder 500cc liquid-cooled engine, using it to reintroduce the 500 Indy handle. This time, the sled was a hot performer based on its lightweight, something many did not realize was at the core of the Indy chassis' amazing performance. Indies were all aluminum and benefited from careful tweaking at the factory to deliver every ounce of horsepower to the snow. The 1989 Indy 500 was the success story of the decade and became the largest selling snowmobile model in history. In the early 1990s, Polaris grabbed the number one market share title by producing more and more Indy variants. The lowly 340 Indy Sport continued in the lineup until the end of the 80s, then morphed into an all new Indy model variant, the Indy Light, powered by a 250 single and a 340 twin. In 1993, Polaris gave the now incredibly popular Indy 650 a 580cc brother, the Indy XLT for extra light triple. We doubt anyone at Polaris knew how big this sled would sell. Rumors put XLT annual production at nearly 100,000 units. Supertrax magazine declared the XLT's melodic exhaust note the national anthem of snowmobiling, and everyone wanted an XLT. Strangely, the competition seemed lost in the early 90s, barely giving Polaris a fight as Indy sales increased year after year along with Polaris market share. From the mid-90s to the end of the decade, Polaris landed three Indy variant body profiles. Truthfully, the company had whipped the now long-in-the-tooth Indy profile pretty hard. It was time for some fresh Indy skin. New engines appeared at this time in the form of Polaris' first domestic-built twin-cylinder two-strokes called Liberties. The move to big bore 700 twin-cylinder power in 1997 shook the foundations of the snowmo biz. After all, wasn't the whole industry supposed to be reacting to the tidal wave of success the XLT Triple was enjoying? Finally, the first all-new Indy in 20 years landed in 1999 as the Indy Edge. Polaris chose to wipe the Indy handle from the Edge in 2000 
and the legend that was Indy came to an end. Interestingly, Polaris encountered their biggest market share challenge in the early 00s when Skidoo introduced the original Rev in 2003. In the absence of the Indy, Skidoo moved into market share leadership. Equally interesting is the model year 2013 reintroduction of the Indy in the new, and keep this in mind, lightweight ProRide chassis. Polaris has reinvented the Indy, leaning on its iconic handle to bring to market a snowmobile which captures much of the essence of the original Indy. The new Indy is 30 pounds lighter than the IQ chassis it replaces. The power from its 600cc, 125 horsepower clean fire two-stroke is unfairly amplified by the Indy's lean and efficient chassis. We have to admit, we felt a little nostalgic riding the reborn 2013 Indy. No snowmobiler over the age of 25 doesn't know what a Polaris Indy is. You either owned and loved one, or you harbored envy in your heart over its imposing performance. Truth is, it'll be a long time before anything challenges the overwhelming 20-year reign of the Polaris Indy. Last year, Skidoo's GSX SE was a very close runner-up in the Snow Tracks Real World Sled of the Year competition. Its biggest drawback was its price, but today, price is not an issue. If you want the most maxed out one-up trail touring sled ever made, this is it. The GSX has long been a favorite of mine, mixing a healthy dose of performance with a heaping pile of comfort features. The only drawback is that riding a GSX might make you a tiny bit insecure in your manliness, but I digress. Is manliness not all about comfort? Yes, of course it is. Hairy-chested men the world over buy sports cars with luxury interiors, SUVs with all kinds of convenience features, and minivans with 280 horsepower motors. Underneath all the grunting and lifting of hoods lays the basic desire to go fast and be comfortable doing it. And that's what the GSX is all about. Its 130 horsepower four-stroke is an overachiever in every way. It's super fast, great on gas, and it's quiet. It's an all-day runner that won't tire you out and is just as comfortable pushing the scene out down Kevlar Lake as it is cruising a big hydroline in Quebec. We've said it again and again, and to be perfectly honest, none of us here at Snow Tracks cares whether or not saying this will offend a few Skidoo diehards. The 1200 Vortex suffers from momentary lag on initial throttle tip-in. Combine this with an extremely low engagement RPM and you've got a sled that feels jumpy. It's real, it's true, it exists, and we don't like it. But we do love everything else about this motor. Once you're rolling, the lag becomes a non-issue. So on those long pulls, all you have to think about is the bellowing four-stroke torque you have under your hood. You could also take some time to think about all the other cool toys you've got pampering your backside. A heated seat, adjustable handlebars, big old Mack truck windshield, maxed out digital gauge, electric reverse, 12 volt outlets, you name it, this thing has it. Right down to its on the fly adjustable air ride suspension. Skidoo calls it ACS, which simply stands for air controlled suspension, and it's not magic. It consists of a tiny pump mounted inside the left side panel mated to an air spring on the rear arm shock. This system is not meant to make the skid stiffer. It's meant to change the spring preload on the rear arm, which affects ride height of the sled and therefore at what point in its travel the skid is operating. More pressure jacks the back of the sled up so it's riding at the top of its travel. This gives the sled less dropout into bumps but offers more up travel. Less pressure lets the sled sag down more. This gives lots of dropout but less up travel. This system also comes in handy when your saddlebags are loaded. The more weight you're carrying, the higher you set your air spring to help maintain your ideal static ride height. At the end of the day, the important takeaway point here is that this system is supremely useful. We find ourselves tweaking the spring as conditions change throughout the day. It's not one of those gimmicky features that's cool to say you have, but not really something you'll ever use. Mating the 136-inch ACS-equipped SC5 rear skid with the Rev XR chassis and front end produces one of the most mellow and predictably handling skidoos you can buy. It's stable and planted in all conditions, turns easily, and stays flat when cornering aggressively. As far as handling goes, this package is excellent. 
The more you think about it, the more it becomes apparent that the GSX SE, despite its reputation as an old man or a woman's sled, is in fact exactly the type of sled an image conscious male should be looking at. But there's one glaring issue that will likely turn away more than a few guys. Let's just put it out there. The 2013 GSX SE isn't the most exciting looking sled ever. Even with its painted tunnel and skid frame, its gray black paint scheme and lack of graphics just isn't awesome. It's stylish, but it doesn't get your motor all revved up. And this has historically been the downfall of the GSX in the minds of guys who really do want all the bells and whistles. If its looks don't measure up, you'll always feel self-conscious. The answer to this problem is simple. Jazz it up a bit, throw some bling at it. Don't make it look like a race light, make it look like a sports car, aggressive yet classy and refined. If anyone could do it, it's definitely Skidoo. Today should be the day that you take a serious look at the GSX SE. Whether it's for its features, its performance and handling, or all of the above, the GSX SE will over deliver in every way. So don't be afraid. Let the world know that you're awesome and that your sled has more toys than anybody else's. At their core, Yamaha is a motor company, so no matter what vehicle I ride, if it's got a tuning fork emblem on it, I know it's going to over deliver in the motor department. But what about the rest of the vehicle and how it fits in its category? While the Vector has called a few different chassis home over the years, it now resides in the previous version of the Apex called the Delta Box 3, a very advanced frame that displays rider forward ergos and perches the rider high up in an attack position, while also allowing for easy sit to stand transitions. But the real question is, does it deliver on those claims? The old Apex was a solid design when it was first produced, however now it starts to feel a little more traditional, and by that I mean that the ergonomics the rider experiences are similar to that of a mid to late 2000s snowmobile. Before you assume I don't like the Vector, you need to hear me out. While the riding position on this sled is old school in comparison to the rest of the market, it's still very technology laden and able to deliver impressive ride quality with traditional riding ergonomics. And that's becoming harder to find these days where lightweight minimalist has taken over. Due to the nature of the 1049cc triple cylinder four stroke, it's really hard to position riders up and on top of this motor. So Yamaha engineers had to figure out a way to deliver solid handling with a larger than two stroke motor package. While certain days I like to go rip the ditches and jump everything in sight, the Vector isn't gonna be the sled that I do that on. However, when the day's ride is long and cold, and I'm looking for comfort both through ride quality and evading the elements, I'll be on the Vector 10 times out of 10, because I truly enjoy traditional riding ergos when I'm out cruising. Our industry's been focused on lightweight and rider-forward ergos since Skidoo brought out the Rev, but I'm here to tell you that it is not the only way, and Yamaha proves that point with a quality snowmobile like the RS Vector. The proper engine package with a finely tuned suspension and chassis will make up for weight almost every time in the trail touring category. Because let's face it, not every rider is looking to be the next X Game freestyle star and rip the approaches. Some of us want reliability, resale value, comfort, and four-stroke perfection. The Vector is all that and power steering. Power steering is a love-hate for me. I really enjoy the way that it works, but I'm not so thrilled that it's the only way you can purchase your Vector because let's all be honest, there's other lighter and cheaper ways to resolve the darting issue. While the Vector doesn't have a severe darting issue, it is still apparent. And during my time riding, I've wondered if the new Yamaha tuner ski featuring double carbides linked with the reduced weight of an EPS deleted Vector would produce similar, if not better front end handling and reduce darting. For sure it would cost significantly less and still be a great sled. And who knows, maybe this will be an entry level version of the Vector in the near future. While I'm on my gripe list, I might as well talk about the other area of this sled I believe that Yamaha needs to take a look at, and that is out back with the Monoshock 2 rear skid. While I do enjoy the ride quality of the Monoshock 2 CK skid, I believe the 2011 Vector GT had the better setup with the KYB Remote Adjust Monoshock 2 RA. The ease of on-the-fly adjustment and toolless use was beautiful. I mean, this was something we all enjoyed and felt the benefits of. 
The new CK skid can still be adjusted, but it's a pain to get under the sled and play with preload when the threaded body has iced up. While I have had a few complaints about the Vector, the truth is it's a great sled. It's got incredible torque and a solid motor package, and it carves corners with ease. And yes, at the end of the day, power steering truly does leave you feeling more limber. As I stated last year when I tested the Apex, if you want a featherweight sled, you're probably not looking at a four-stroke. If you want ultimate durability and resale that will impress, you're probably not looking at a two-stroke. And if you want the best fit and finish in the business with impressive ride quality, comfortable ergonomics, and loads of technology focused on improving your snowmobile experience, you needn't look any further than the Yamaha Vector. While it's made many progressions over the years, Yamaha has tweaked the Vector into what I believe is the best variation yet, rich with technology that you wouldn't expect to find in the mid-horsepower category. Without a doubt, the most common questions we get asked here at Snow Tracks all relate to suspension. How do I set it up? Why does my sled not ride good? And how do I properly make adjustments? Apparently, modern snowmobile suspensions aren't quite as simple as some people think they are. No kidding. Today's snowmobile suspensions are complex feats of engineering. The way they function almost boggles the mind. When you add current shock technology into the mix, it's not hard to get lost. But you don't need to call Stephen Hawking to get your sled to ride right. You just need to follow a few simple and universal steps. The first thing you need to do after you pick up your new scooter is verify the shock settings. Believe it or not, many snowmobiles come right from the factory with uneven compression and rebound settings. Making sure they're all set to about halfway will at least get you started on even ground. The next step is one most people overlook, and it can have as big an effect on the overall ride of your sled as getting your clicker set to where you want them. You need to get your ride height set to the manufacturer's suggested level. Shocks and suspensions are designed to work most efficiently and effectively within a specific range of their travel. This is different for every brand and every style of suspension, so read your manual to find out where your ride height should be set. Ride height is adjusted using the springs, and despite what many believe, this is the primary purpose of the springs both front and rear. Their job is to hold the sled at your preset height and return it to that height after the suspension has been cycled. Measure your ride height as per your manual's instructions and take your measurements with the rider on board. Some shocks have cam style adjusters with only a few settings. Others have threaded collars that are infinitely adjustable. Whatever the case may be, if you find you can't get your spring set tight enough to achieve proper ride height, don't worry. Your dealer can order and install heavier springs. The next step in your suspension setup journey is again one most people just skip altogether. You need to start at zero, or full soft on your compression clickers. Most shocks come from the factory with the compression set at about 50%. The problem with starting your setup at this point is that it's hard to get an accurate reading of what effect your changes up or down are actually having. Starting with your compression set at zero gives you a baseline to work from. Now we get to the fun part. Once your ride height is adjusted and your clickers are set to zero, it's time to go riding. Find a realistically bumpy section of trail and ride through it at the speed you would normally ride. If you feel the sled bottoming, add in a few clicks of compression, but don't touch the springs. Repeat this process until the sled is resisting bottoming, but remaining plush enough to still be comfortable. Keep in mind, your sled should bottom on the biggest bumps. That way, you know you're using all the travel you paid good money for, and you want to get your money's worth. Once your compression is set for your average riding situations, you can use the compression clicker knobs to fine tune the ride for different trail conditions. If you can feel the trail getting rougher and you're bottoming more than you think you should, simply spin up a few clicks of compression. When the trail gets smooth again, turn the knobs back to your original settings. Now that you've got your ride height and compression settings taken care of, you may need to tweak the rebound settings just a bit. And this is where most riders get overwhelmed and just give up. Rebound is what controls the speed at which the shock extends back to your ride height after it's been compressed. An optimal rebound setting is one that lets the skid frame or the skis follow the contour of the ground at average trail riding speeds, but doesn't let the shock extend too quickly, which would make the sled feel like a pogo stick, or too slowly, which would make the sled feel overly stiff. 
Slow rebound causes a condition called packing up. If the suspension can't rebound fully before it hits the next bump, your suspension will continually get shorter until the sled is essentially riding on only the last few inches of travel. Taking away some rebound damping will once again allow the suspension to extend back to your static ride height before it absorbs the next impact. Once you have your ride height, compression, and rebound dialed, it's a really good idea to make some notes of where it's set. That way, if you ever have to remove a suspension component for maintenance or reset up your suspension to carry more weight or for different riding conditions, you can find your way back to your optimal setup far more easily. Snow Tracks has been sponsored by Polaris Terrain Domination, Arctic Cat, Share Our Passion, Yamaha Snowmobiles Built for the Real World, that's the Yamaha Advantage, and by Go Ride Ontario, there's no place like this.